Welcome to Pete's Property Podcast, brought to you by Buyers Buyers and hosted by Pete Wargent, buyers agent, finance and real estate expert, and all-round property guru, plus published author. Join Pete for 30 minutes as he chats all things property with a new guest each week. Learn practical tips from the movers and shakers in the property industry and well-known personalities sharing their property journeys. G'day, welcome to this week's episode of the Pete Wargent Property Pod. I've got a fellow Englishman on the show this week, but uh, don't hold it against him. Welcome Chris <laughs> Booth from Lydian Finance. Hey Pete, nice to be um, here with you this morning. Yes, it's just started raining just as I uh, started recording, so uh, true to form. Seems, I think that's the third week in a row that's happened, so uh, hopefully the um, the background noise holds up okay. So uh, Chris, tell us a bit about um, your background, where you come from, where you, where you hail from, and um, you know, tell us a bit about your uh, childhood. Yeah, sure. Well, um, look, I'm a, I'm a failed Yorkshireman, and um, what I mean by that, Pete, is my mum and dad are, are both from Bradford, born and bred Bradford, and all my family are from Bradford. And my parents, um, well, my dad got a job for commercial union when I was very, very young and eloped over the border to Derbyshire to have me and my brother. So we were born in Matlock. You know, being 50 back in those days when we were young boys, um, you had aspirations to play for Yorkshire, but you had to be born in Yorkshire. So we were complete failures for my my parents early on, really, not being born in Yorkshire. We ended up moving to sunny Scunthorpe, which was, um, again, my dad, we kind of sort of followed my dad around with Commercial Union, to be honest. And Scunthorpe, the steelworks there, my dad looked after that company there for the insurance um, side of the business, which was, which was, and it's a beautiful sort of area around Scunthorpe. Scunthorpe itself, as you probably know, is is not the prettiest of um, <laughs> of towns or, or cities. Yeah, I used to sort of have fairly country life, you know, I used to walk around just a bush in my barber jacket, pair of green wellies and pretending to be a farmer as a, as a young kid. The sort of insurance side of the, the business for my dad uh, took a turn and um, he ended up being offered a job on the Isle of Man, which is on the west coast of England, in between Ireland, England and Scotland. So we went over there as um, as young kids. So I think I was, what, was I 13, 14 years old, moving to the Isle of Man. Uh, very different as well. So I had a, probably a broad um, Yorkshire accent. Uh, moving to a, an island where everyone speaks with a Scouse accent. So there's complications there. How quickly could I lose my uh, Yorkshire accent and become a Scouser? So, uh, but uh, the, Isle of, the Isle of Man's very pretty, very beautiful place. But as soon as I was 18, I wanted to run away and, and go to Manchester for, uh, University with my friends and and, and get off art of the island, really. So, um, yeah, it's a pretty, uh, it's interesting. There's a few uh, parallels there. I've mentioned that thing before on uh, my podcast. I've my dad used to move around for work an awful lot. And um, like yourself, actually, I went to school in West Yorkshire for about six years in Huddersfield. We had six years in Matlock where my dad was a probation officer. So these are all sort of northern English small towns or cities, I guess. And um, Yeah, very rural. Yeah, and like like yourself, I had a bit of time in uh, Lincolnshire as well. But uh, when it comes to university time I sort of went went to the city um because you know that's where the action is somewhat different I think <laughs> it, in Australia I think um people often live with their parents when they go to university but it's a pretty different model in in the UK so obviously just like myself uh, you wound up in Sydney so how did you, what brought you to Australia and how did you get into a career in the sort of finance in the first place yeah, so well, I mean that, that that takes me to Manchester. I mean, I, I ran away in the last minute to try and get a place into Manchester to go to university, and the only course that I could get at the time was a catering course. So I thought, right, it gets me off the Isle of Man. I know nothing about hospitality or catering, but this will do. So it got me to Manchester, got me hanging out with my friends, and um, yeah, look, I, I was very happy doing the course. But I mean, I think the the principles of the degree was 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 great because it gave you the obviously the, the foundations of of catering and running running sort of small catering businesses but you know, we, we had elements in there about finance and, and running business as well which I, I found interesting but the Isle of Man was always a draw for me you know with the Isle of Man um, my mum and dad lived there and I had to go back there really to save 
aspiration. He always wanted to go traveling. As soon as I finished university, I just wanted to go travel around the world, have family in Australia, wanted to kind of run away from it all, really. So I was I was growing my hair very long, just like yourself, but I, I follically failed later on in life. Yeah, as you probably know, earning two pounds an hour in a bar or a hotel, working long hours and shift work and things like that, I wasn't really saving the money I needed to to get my uh, my ticket overseas. Um, in the Isle of Man, everyone um, had bank jobs and you were getting paid five pounds an hour for working nine to five. So, um, yeah, very fortunately, my mum invited me into a bank. Um, it was Royal Bank of Canada back then. And, um, yeah, I started doing all the, the, the paperwork and the processing for the, um, the, the their large call accounts. So it wasn't very, very interesting. But, but what was interesting, I used to sit there in my lunchtime with the two Treasury boys. And they were the ones who were clearing all the money market transactions, doing all of the, um, you know, the transactions for clients and things like that. And I found all that sort of finance um, and that sort of sexier side of the finance, very, very stimulating. So, yeah, my first job, really proper job, was working for the Royal Bank of Scotland um, as a young Treasury junior. And that job was foreign exchange, money markets. And, um, yeah, I, I certainly found it fascinating and very, very interesting. And secondly, I think one of the big things for me at the time, I had to, um, everyone was reading the Financial Times. And, and back then I was like 23 and, you know, the first page I'd be kind of falling asleep or I had no idea what I was reading. So my main goal when I was like tw- in my early 20s was to have, you know, be able to read the Financial Times and understand exactly what it meant from start, middle and end, which was a challenge in itself when I was used to reading The Sun or probably The Daily Mail as a step up, you know. So, um, yeah, but that was my that was my initial goal when I got my job at um, at, at the Royal Bank of Scotland. And um yeah, so that fascination about money markets, international you know, currency exchange, derivatives and things like that was, I suppose, my calling in, in finance back then. But then saved up my pot of gold, went traveling, found a woman in Australia and um, it kind of that, that working on the Isle of Man fell apart, really. Um, Kelly lived in Sydney. She was from Glebe. So we ran away to Vegas and got married when I was 20. Yeah, 26. There was some there was some dating in between in England and travel around Europe and things like that, which was fantastic. But um, her and I have got quite similar sort of uh, tastes. We like to go out party, have, you know, meet good friends. But also that traveling bug is is still with us today. So, um, yeah, aspirationally, we, we, you know, we still want to continue those travels. But, yeah, so that kind of led me to Australia. And the first job I got in Australia uh, was within the Bank of China. So I wanted to continue the treasury stuff. The, uh, the only job that I got sort of I could find at the time outside of the you know, CBA, NABs and all that kind of kind of thing, the big banks, was a, a, an opportunity at the Bank of China. So, um, yeah, I started work at the Bank of China as, um, as, as a treasury person. And my job was to co- cover the 11 a.m. cash, run the current the foreign exchange currency books. Um, and that, that was, those two were my jobs. Yeah, very interesting, very culturally fascinating at the time as well. Yeah, you've had um, quite a a long career in finance and it, this is one of the reasons I wanted to get you on is to to talk about um well firstly about what you do today with Lydian but also then just to work through some observations about what you've seen in particularly in uh, business and investing about what works and what doesn't I definitely um concur with what you say I, I can certainly remember working in London all the young men in suits walking across London Bridge with the uh, the FT under their arms, but never read. They just used to carry it around. Like, but because you said a lot of people uh, sort of put on that veneer of uh, sort of understanding what they were doing, but uh, you know, I think for a lot of times it was just carrying around the paper for a show. And uh, yeah, like yourself, I used to read the Sun newspaper for the for the football results. And um, so you you uh, came over to Australia as did I actually as a as a young man in my early twenties, obviously. You enjoyed the um, the lifestyle and the climate in in Sydney. Um, so now these days you're you're building a very rapidly growing business at Lydian Finance. So you've got over a dozen uh, mortgage brokers there now, and I know you do other stuff besides. So tell us a little bit about what Lydian does and how you're growing the, that business so quickly. I think it goes back to uh, my early days when I first, so coming out of uh, Bank of China, I ended up going to the Commonwealth Bank and working their premium banking division. And back then it was all about being able to provide 
not only um, home loan advice, but also provide financial advice within the, within the, your client group. So uh, the back then, CBA offered a service whereby that um, you would have a relationship manager, which was myself at the time. And then within our team, we had a stockbroker, we had a financial planner, we had a, a business banker as well. And the idea of these little mini pods was that your clients could get serviced around not only their you know their home and their their, their property advice but also get all of the the um, extra advice with the share markets and and financial plans as well and and that that sort of I really found that interesting and I think I think you know that was one of the the, the key principles I've I've held all my life I think um having good advisors in your world with which to speak to take counsel from and then you know support that execution side of things has always been very important to me so you know my journey starting Lydian really was you know I'm, I'm probably again um I've always been late in starting things all right so I was 50 last year um but before I start something I, I just need to be 100 confident in one my knowledge and ability to do that ha- have the capability and the energy to do that as well and um you know the, the the years prior I've worked in I've worked in partnership with a couple of businesses helped to build though a, a business within a business and learned a lot about what not what to do um but to you know captured all of those really really good things and and Lydian's all really about you know the last sort of 15 20 years of my career all of the good things which I've done um in support of of um helping you know mums and dads middle Australia achieve um you know a, a wealth mature wealth um that's the goal of Lydian so you know number one yes we've grown very quickly but um it's uh, you know we've aligned our mortgage brokers with financial planners and accountants so anyone who really as runs a business from a finance perspective i.e. accounting financial planning but doesn't offer mortgage broking from a transaction perspective um the lydian the lydian guys plug in there and enable the uh, these businesses to participate in that that service for their clients and again the success for me is always that when you you know when your client comes in to meet you that you've got specialists within that that transaction who can field you know the accounting side of things the superannuation insurance side of things the property side of things the mortgage side and the lending side of things and lastly the legal side of things so having that deal team i think is important so we just go out there and find partners who want um, a debt and lending partner to plug into those deal teams and and that's our focus and and my background's been mainly in financial planning so really looking to align with uh, financial planners who who would like to give um debt strategy but can't implement the debt advice piece and that's what we do for them yeah so um, so you've obviously had um a long in industry uh, career and you've obviously stressed there the importance of good quality advice um having observed um all those clients over the years um i know that um we often say that compound growth is the most powerful form uh, force in finance or the eighth wonder of the world. Is there anything that stands out as a uh, good strategy or uh, good behavioral traits? So anything you've observed in that regard? Yeah, I'd, I'd say patience. That's probably the number one. So, um, yeah, I'm very fortunate to have clients I've known for sort of 20 years. Yeah. And when when I first started working with them, providing lending for their properties or whatever it was that they were trying to do at the time, um, you know, it was a struggle. And um, to get, you know, to get the first investment or the first property in place, you know, we collectively worked very hard to do that. But then the second one was a little bit easier. But, you know, I look, I'm very fortunate now having clients I've known for such a long period of time. And I participated in, you know, in the in the mortgage broking side of things with their success. So, you know, at, at my announcer days, we started clients, you know, we saw clients who were buying their first property, whether it be, you know, rides, Ermington, Coogee, you know, Liverpool, whatever it would be, that, you know, to see those guys now actually own their homes and have paid off their debt, but now have accumulated either an investment property or two investment properties or or invested in shares or managed funds with the help and advice of financial planners, that 10-year sort of patience and timeline has meant that these people that sort of get into 50 years old have have, um, actually got quite a mature uh, financial position, which gives, you know, again, which gives you that flexibility to to maybe have a bit more of a passion play in your sort of latter half of your life with your employment. So that that would be one of the things which I've seen. So patience would be uh, the biggest one, yeah? Yeah, I think so. I mean, um, I think it was um, maybe it was Jim Rohn or somebody similar who said that success is doing ordinary things 
extraordinarily well. And if you can combine that with patience, I often watch um, Warren Buffett videos and you think, how could uh, somebody like Buffett managing such an enormous uh, sum of money these days still be achieving outstanding results? And it's it's just, I guess, a, a combination of uh, common sense decisions, uh, sort of uncommon sense in a way, um, also patience, and um, and discipline, I think a combination of those things over time. I was talking to um, my wife uh, yesterday as we were walking around uh, Noosa, and um, it, I was just uh, sort of just observing you know, some of the success that people have achieved in Australia over time. And in many respects, um, Australians over the past 30 years have you know, they've really won the jackpot in terms of where they're located in the world. I think it was... Um, Donald Horn, who said in the book uh, The Lucky Country that Australia is um, a country run by, you know, a lucky country run by second rate people who share in its luck. But there, there are a number of things. Um, and this is a, that was 19. Well, that's good for us then, eh? <laughs> Yeah. But, I mean, uh, even uh, 60 years on, there's still a good element of truth in that. But there's, there's a number of things that Australia has really benefited from. Obviously, massively resources rich. You know, I guess given what's been going on in the world, you know, that's a very strong position for Australia to be in. I think in some ways, uh, lucky in terms of the distance. We're so far away from some of the problem areas of the world, which we know a lot about. And mm. um, we've had a bit of a lucky history as well. And I, I think a combination of those things plus a patient outlook, um, you know, Credit Suisse always shows Australia right up near the top in terms of the wealthiest countries in the world. And it just keeps on ongoing and some of those places you mentioned at the beginning sort of rural parts of britain where uh, industries have closed down have not not shared in the same level of luck um i think uh, i mean uh, one of the things i've seen uh, with clients over the years is that it's increasingly common for people to have a big setback i guess whether it's a separation or a divorce or you know sometimes people self sabotage is there, mm. is there anything that people can do to to try and avoid uh, the self sabotage because as you mentioned uh, I think discipline and patience are the key particularly in real estate as an investment but is there anything uh, you've observed that people do well when they get sort of good long term outcome that's a, a really good question um you know I, I've never I've not made perfect decisions in my time um, you know, purchasing property and, and things like that. I sold a home in Ermington many years ago and you know Kelly and I were going through quite a lot of financial stress at the time you know we'd got three kids going to you know kindy down the road and um, really couldn't afford to have this Ermington home which was an investment but just wasn't earning the income and we knew aspirationally long term that that property would appreciate but um, at the time you know that life sort of got a, got ahead of us a bit and um, so yeah so we sold that property and it would be you know be a fantastic property to be in our kit bag today having said that though uh, you know you know, with that sort of step backwards, we did make concerted decisions to invest in other things. So, you know, my background, again, being in property, we I invested a property in myself and a super fund quite early on, and that did really well. Um, invested in a Bondi Junction apartment, and that has done extremely well as well. Unfortunately, three children couldn't live in that little apartment. So we kept it and, and sort of decided to stay east and, and rented rather than bought, which was, uh, you know, that's that's obviously got complications itself but aside from that we've used the equity in those properties to invest again so we've got a property up in windsor in brisbane which we bought many years ago and also um, i invested in the businesses which i participated in so as i said before i was a partner in a group called the announcer group and and bought into that group because i you know i felt aspirationally having these different investments in my world would suit me well long term which you know the properties have done particularly well the shares in the business have done okay probably could have done better um but now again you know going to you know to Lydian now this is you know a, a large pool of that equity is mine and um you know aspirationally um you know we've got 10 years to build Lydian up and, and that will be a you know another nest egg for us that business do you want to save on buyer's agent fees you could save thousands with buyer's buyers as Australia's most extensive network of buyer's agents we can lock in highly competitive prices. Plus, our national network of buyer's agents are some of the best in the business. So get the buyer's buyer's advantage and talk to us today. Call 1-800-975-051 or visit 
buyersbuyers.com.au. I've um, often spoken at uh, seminars and events where people do this exercise and they almost draw sort of a graph of their progress through their life. And I, I don't think I've ever seen anybody just draw a, a graph going from the bottom left to the top right. You know, like, there's always a setback <laughs> somewhere along the line and uh, uh, sort of success and wealth creation is is never a, a straight line. And I guess the most important thing is when you suffer a setback or an adverse outcome, it, it's as much, um, well, we know those things are going to happen in life. So it's more important how you respond uh, to those outcomes um, as much as probably as important as what actually happens to you. Let's talk a bit about what's happening in the market at the moment. Um, uh, I guess we, we've known for, for months and months that fixed mortgage rates have been on the rise. I guess um, a lot of people mm. rushed to fix their mortgage rates uh, last year when they, I guess we saw unprecedented low mortgage rates. Um, I guess that wasn't a big surprise, but are we starting to see now uh, variable mortgage rates on the rise as well. And what do you think might happen over the next year or two? Yeah, I mean, it's, so it's funny. So the, the variable interest rates have kind of not moved. Um, I, I suppose the funding cost from a, a balance sheet from a bank's perspective is still extremely cheap because they, any deposits there, they're not they're not paying any interest on. So therefore, they can use it to fund the variable um, home loans. So we're still seeing, you know, 1.99% interest rate, rates on variable. As you said before, the fixed rate, um, that's certainly gone up. That's gone up very quickly. And we're now seeing sort of, you know, sub, you know, mid three and a half um, percent interest rates, nearly four percent, just under four um, percent for fixed rates. You know, three to five years, which is you know a big difference from where we are variably. But you know, the prospects for the next few years are the, inevitably the interest rates have got to go up. I mean, you know, it's not long since we were you know writing loans five years ago at you know five and a half six percent. So we've gone through this incredible time where interest rates have gone so 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 low. In fact, uh, almost negative interest rates. To be honest it's not sustainable we have to go back to a more normalized um, interest rate environment the rba are pretty um, have been pretty vocal about that and but very constructive about how they're actually you know getting the pillars back in place to actually um, increase interest rates you know we will see probably 50 basis points in june july this year i think that's probably reasonable and that will be passed on so you know i think for the next two years if i, I still think we're in a fortunate environment of seeing interest rates you know, between that sort of three, four percent, which is still extremely cheap. But that being said, um, you know, anyone who's sort of entering into buying a property today and doing their numbers around a two and a half percent interest rate and thinking that's going to be there for 30 years, um, you know, that's that's where the advice from a mortgage broker and people who've been in the industry a lot longer comes into play. You know, we're assessing debt at six percent um and higher in some instances. So I think having that sort of prudent lens on where interest rates go and assessing your affordability at six percent is a good thing. Our banks here have been very, very uh, disciplined in that sort of uh, assessment piece. So I, I don't think the impact of increased interest rates will have a massive effect to um, mums and dads paying those loans. I think what it will do, though, it will it will um, start to change the lifestyle expenses that we we've come to sort of. Um, get comfortable with things like uber eats and everything delivered to your house or you know going out out for dinners and things like that. i think we'll start to have to call some of those discretionary expenses to afford the home yeah i mean as you mentioned i, I guess new mortgages are almost automatically assessed with a 300 basis points buffer so i don't mm. think it's going to be much in the way of systemic risks from rising mortgage rates um i think the other thing that's often overlooked as well is that monetary policy and interest rates they don't operate in a vacuum if um if mortgage rates are going to rise over the next three years well that wouldn't be a surprise but we should probably expect to see incomes rising by say 10 percent over three years rents could easily do 10 to 20 percent even in one year the way things are going in some markets and obviously population growth is just starting to come uh, roaring back as well so th it's um, the, the, the rising interest rate environment is not necessarily a bad thing to the extent that it reflects a, an amazing recovery, really, in the Australian economy from where things might have been. What, what kind of borrowing uh, strategies are your clients uh, typically operating, particularly with regards to investors? Is there anything that people are looking to do these days? I know that one of the things that's very uniquely Australian is the use of uh, offset accounts and redraw facilities. What would a typical 
client borrowing strategy look like for your um, for your clients? Yeah, so I mean, husband wife buying a you know lumpy own home. Uh, lumpy debt for their own home i would suggest you know have that offset redraw in place you know th- those little bits of savings in that offset account to save interest expenses on your loan compounded over you know 20 30 years can save you many years on your home loan so that's a simple one one of the big strategies that we do use is that sort of repurposing of your equity you know many people who bought sort of five ten years ago were now left with a property which has got a lot of equity in it incomes are still reasonably strong having a strategy around how you recycle the equity in your property to actually participate and invest, I think that's the most important thing. So having your debts, one, structured properly to reflect, you know, what is your investment debt? What is your non-deductible debt? Work really hard with your cash flow on your non-deductible debt by having, you know, quarterly, annual, half-yearly meetings with um, either your broker or your your financial planner is important. But then once you're paying down that non-deductible debt and it's becoming very, very affordable, how are you repurposing that cash flow to then benefit you long term? Again, talking about that patience. So, um, you know, AMP still have a, a fantastic master limit product, which is the last one in the marketplace. And it allows you to, to, to sort of dissect um, up your debts in accordance with purpose. But also it's a really simple tool to actually tap into your equity in your property to, to actually invest whether it be managed funds or the property, other investment asset classes, whatever it will be. So really, um, you know, for me, is, is don't sort of sit on one big home, one a large pool of equity in that. that really do start to think about how you can accumulate wealth um, outside of the superannuation environment because, you know, we're all living longer. You know, my folks are nearly 80 now and, um, you know, they're fit as a fiddle. Um, so waiting for that inheritance, I don't think it's going to come, Pete. I've, I probably, um, I've got to earn a few dollars myself. So, you know, <laughs> sitting back and um, sitting back and doing nothing, we'll get to that retirement stage and not have those, have that extra income that we need to have, you know, holidays and things like that, or dipping into too much of our superannuation in the first few years and then having nothing. Um, I think that's a poor strategy. So having, again, that long lens, and, and utilizing the, the the you know the good fortunes that we've had over the last ten years in properties appreciating, I think is important. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think um, you, you mentioned superannuation. There's a lot of people, including myself. Um, I've spent a fair chunk of my career working overseas, and then I was self-employed, and I've had periods unpaid in my own business. And for various reasons, superannuation is just not going to cut it for people like me. And with thirty percent of Australians born overseas of course there must be uh, millions of people in similar situation which is why it's so important to look at ways to build an asset base outside of your superannuation um and like yourself i'm not uh I'm from a family of seven so i'm not holding out too much hope for an inheritance because uh, <laughs> the three-fifths of bugger all is still bugger all so you've got to look to do uh things outside of your superannuation of course super is a tremendously tax um, tax advantaged environment for people who are able to contribute uh, to it but it's increasingly popular for people to do stuff in real estate outside of their superannuation as well um yeah federal election coming up um both parties have been uh, spraying ideas around about first home buyer guarantees and regional property buying guarantees and um, various other bits and pieces Besides, the coalition is talking about 50,000 places in total. Um, do you get um, clients coming to you saying, well, look, I'm a first home buyer. I'm interested in using one of these um, government stimulus uh, packages. Do, do you get uh, clients coming to you with requests like that? And what kind of impact do you think that might have on the market? Yeah, so I think firstly, yes, we do. I mean, look, uh, my um, my core clientele is, is sort of similar to my age and demographic myself so i'm sort of i'm 50 51 this year so um a lot of times it's more i'm speaking to the mums and dads who've got kids who are now 20 21 22 whatever just leaving university and, and getting their first job and how can they help their kids into the first property and it's it's something that a lot of parents you know don't sleep well at night because um, it's so expensive to get them in the financial benefits that you get as a first homeowner grant the first home loan deposit scheme and the stamp duty exemption are, are just an amazing amazingly um 
powerful stepping stone into property um you know if you're a young person and independent getting that that sort of leg up is is uh, pretty cool and it's a lot of money we're talking about um the the difficulties have been that um you know especially for the first time loan deposit scheme there's been hasn't been many places and those spa- spaces and places have been allocated to people with pre-approval who haven't found property so that the difficulty is often um when, when we're giving advice we have to go find a lender which has has got a place and, and potentially wouldn't be the perfect lender or product for that client um, and that's been difficult um but you know that financial benefit of having those schemes uh, applied you know for the for the money is, is something you've got to fight for so we'd always recommend that you you know you, you, you go get those trying to buy new i think is is difficult to get the first home own grant i don't think that's probably the best the best best possible outcome to get sort of 10 15 grand to buy a, a brand new property because i think you, you you are paying a premium for that property um the other big thing you know like i said before talking to parents the parents are willing to sac- if parents are willing to sacrifice um, some equity in their own property to do like a guarantee for kids to get in and and you know those family pledges are, are quite prevalent now that's how i would sort of look at and and help you know my kids to get into property but long term again you know um if if someone at that young age is looking to get it and invest in property and and they certainly have that you know long lens and looking at sort of 10 years plus the first properties is always the hardest after that gets easier i think it's a it's a it's a great thing to utilize whether labor or or um, the liberals stay in in, in power I, I don't know um but the the government benefit scheme i think is is important and i, I think uh, you know whether it's the state or the federal uh, benefits i think they'll, they'll, they'll continue stimulating property activity i think what we're seeing right now is there's probably a bit of a fall off on people looking to buy property right now i've certainly seen the volumes of home loans fall off in the last sort of three months so we're all a bit nervous about the election interest rates going up you know what's happening you know geopolitically overseas and things so um we've had a bit of a slowdown just recently but it'd be interesting to see who comes into into power yeah, it's a long-term game, right? I, I think um, historically election periods have tended to see a drop-off in activity and we've had a whole whole range of public holidays and disruptions anyway over the past couple of weeks. Um, the Bank of Mum and Dad is quite a topical uh, subject at the moment. There's, I think Australia is about to go through a, a huge um, a transfer of intergenerational wealth. Um, mm. You mentioned... Um, United Kingdom earlier, where there's a 40% inheritance tax, one of the reasons I'm not holding out for uh, much of an (laughs) inheritance. But Australia, for various um, political and other reasons, never really gone in for the death duties over the past Mm. 50 years. And uh, with household wealth, I mean, it's absolutely soared in Australia, $10 trillion of household wealth and, and beyond now. Um, heading towards 15 trillion you know so um, there's a huge amount of wealth there that's going to get passed on in the coming decade or two and it's one of the reasons I'm generally bullish or optimistic for for residential uh, land values in real estate because it it gets passed on and uh, I guess housing wealth is ultimately a stock um, not a flow Um, so on that subject um, obviously your immediate uh, challenges over the coming decade will be growing Lydian um, into a, a bigger and more successful business than it already is. Um, but um, I, I see on my Instagram feed occasionally, Chris, popping up pictures of you uh, sailing around Sydney Harbour. So obviously sailing is a uh, a passion of yours. Uh, what do you think um, the end game might look like for you? Is it going to be uh, uh, skippering a yacht around um, <laughs> Circular Quay? <laughs> Well, I think um, aspirationally, I look at other people who are doing what I should be doing, Pete, and, you know, seeing you holidaying in Portugal and, and Europe, you know, last last summer, which is which was pretty nice. Aspirationally, I'd like to be doing that too. So, you know, for me, Lydian is, is really, um, has been about, I suppose, number one, you know, building a business quickly and, and, and you know, doing something ses- successful. You know, we're all about building a great community, a really nice club. Um, we're advice driven. We want to be working with great partners. Uh, you know, f- for me, though, the workplace now has to be completely flexible. Um, I, I, You know, Lydian right now is a work from anywhere 
um, business, although we do have a new HQ going into Sydney, which will be cool soon. Um, so that flexibility of, of working from anywhere, I think, is is pretty cool. And also, as we grow as well, personally, hopefully I get a bit of financial stability as well. So um, well, the, I'll, that will happen naturally when my kids leave home. So um, I'm hoping they you know, disappear pretty quickly. And then it's just I've got to you know, take me and Kelly away for a holiday instead of taking three other kids as well who who are expensive but yeah doing it on your sort of my own terms is is that and yeah aspirationally you you know i think um having a yacht being able to have the ability to sort of sail around the mediterranean sail around sydney harbour sail around australia and still work and, and things would be would be fantastic but yeah i've even i've even you know contemplated even potentially having a second job outside of uh, lending one of the things i do on a weekend is work on a party boat with a mate and you know cleaning the dunny and um you know emptying the dirty bottles at the end of the night and things like that it's funny how you you, you kind of miss those things it's fun so um trying to sort of balance have a bit of um you know personal balance in my life is is great and lydian allows me to do that on my terms which which i think is, is that's the most important thing for me now being 50 um, and finding out i don't play well with others has, has, has been the biggest learning part of it so uh, just looking after you know me and, and Lydian and building the empire as it were um has been fun yeah that, that I think that's it looking at people who do the those um aspirational things as well as building businesses as well is, is cool yeah fantastic so some uh, great insights uh, this week from you Chris in terms of um the, the psychology I guess of wealth creation that you've seen with your clients uh, confidence to look at the long-term price trend and not the short, short-term noise, but also, as you mentioned, just doing those uh, simple things extra- extraordinarily well and just uh, based around um, strong advice and a good team, and um, you'll get some very good long-term results. So if people want to know a little bit uh, more about Lydian Finance or want to get in contact with you, where should they go for a bit more? Yep, www.lydian with a y dot com dot au. Um, I'm on LinkedIn all the time. Um, if they want to see my dodgy pictures on Facebook, they're happy to do that or Instagram. Um, but yeah, reach out or come to yourself, Pete. I, I know um, you'll put point them in the right direction. And if anyone needs a dunny cleaner for their super yacht, uh, they know exactly <laughs> where to come. So, uh, uh, Chris, thank you uh, so much for joining, and um, look forward to hearing much more from Lydian and the team in due course. Cheers. Thanks, Pete. Thanks for listening to Pete's Property Podcast, powered by Buyers Buyers. Don't forget to subscribe and join us next time as Pete chats all things property with a new guest. And just a reminder that the information provided in this podcast is general advice only and doesn't take into account your personal financial situation or needs. You should always consult a licensed professional to discuss your individual personal circumstances.